Last week, I showed you how to create a multi-tenant application using Active Record scopes. In this episode, I want to show you how to do the same thing, but at the database level, using Postgres. Now I'm working with the same example application where I have a forum dedicated to cheese, and there are many topics here, and each topic can have multiple posts. My goal here is to turn this into a multi-tenant application where each tenant has their own forum with their own set of data. And I'll distinguish the tenants using a subdomain here. So cheese.forum.dev would go to this forum and I want one called Chunky Bacon, which would have its own set of data on a separate forum. By the way, I'm using the PAL server, so that allows me to use subdomains here in development. Now here's a database YAML file for this app, and as you can see, it's already set up using Postgres for the database, like I show in episode 342. There's a cool feature that Postgres provides called schemas, which will allow us to separate the data for each tenant. Now, if you're using MySQL or some other database which doesn't support this, uh, you can accomplish something similar by using a separate database for each tenant, but that gets kind of messy, has scaling issues, and a schemas just feels like a much nicer solution. The documentation on Postgres schemas is quite nice and worth reading. Uh, one way to think of schemas is a way to namespace a table. Now this becomes quite powerful when you combine it with a search path. Uh, you have the ability to set a search path in Postgres, and this will uh, specify which schemas it should look into for the data. A good place to try this out is a database console which we can access with the Rails DB command. Here I can type the backslash dt command to get a list of tables that are available and the schema which they are in. Currently, all these four tables used in my Rails application are in the public schema, which is provided by default. I can also run the dn command, which will list out the different schemas available. Currently, only the public one is. So let's create a new schema. I'll just call it foo. And running the dn again, command again shows us that schema. Now at the moment, if I create a new table, it's going to create it in the public schema. I can prefix a table with the schema name to create it elsewhere. Now if I try to perform an action on that table, it's not going to work unless I specify the schema. You can see here that the, uh, it says that table does not exist, so I need to call foo.items to access it. Now if I don't want to use the uh, namespace every time, I can add the schema to my search path. We can see that the uh, search path is currently set to $user and public. The $user will just use the current username, which in my case is rbates, as a schema, so it will look for a schema under that name if one exists. Now let's try changing this search path to foo, public. So now I'll be able to reference the items table directly because it'll use that foo schema. And if I type in backslash dt, we can see that the public tables are available to us as well, so we can use those without specifying a namespace since we added it to our search path. All right, once you're done testing, you can drop the uh, schema and you can pass in the cascade option to delete all of the data uh, relevant to the schema. Now that we know how schemas work, let's use a different one for each tenant to separate the data. First, I'm going to generate a new model, let's call it tenant, and give it a subdomain attribute. And then I'll migrate the database to create that table. And then I'm going to hop in the console to set this up. So in here, I'll create a new tenant record and give it a subdomain of cheese. Now, whenever making a tenant, I also need to create a schema for it. Uh, to do so, I'll need to interact directly with the database connection. So let me reference that in a variable for easy access. So on this database connection, I can call execute to execute some SQL statements. So let's call create schema and I'll call it tenant one. And I can also set the schema search path through the connection. And let's set this just to that new schema. Now, since I didn't include the public schema, if I try to uh, query anything on the database, I'm going to get this exception because that table does not exist. Next, I need to load in all the tables into this schema, and I can do so by just executing the schema.rb file in my Rails app. So now if I try calling post.all, it's just going to return an empty array because we don't have any data in that table. So this is what we want, so that each tenant can have a completely separate set of data. However, there are some tables that you'll want to share between tenants, for example, the tenants table. Because right now, if I try to access any tenants, just an empty array here, instead I want to be able to access all of them. So to do this, I'll need to uh, drop the table uh, called tenants, and that will just drop it within that schema. And so if I change the uh, schema search path here to include the uh, tenant one and the public schema, 
Now when I call tenant.all, it's going to find the tenant within the public schema because that is in our search path, and we don't have a tenants table within our tenant schema. Now post.all still returns nothing because our tenant schema has that table, which doesn't include any records, even though our public uh, schema also has that uh, table. So the order of the search path is important. It's going to stop at the tenant schema if it finds a table there matching. Now, if you want to create a schema automatically whenever a tenant is created, you can do so through a callback, something like this. So this will end up doing the same thing that I did in the console just automatically. I have this after create callback called create schema, which triggers this method, and this creates that schema here. And then I have this scope schema method, which accepts a block. And what it will do is allow me to uh, scope the uh, search path to just that tenant or pass and other pass in here if I want to, and then ensure that it falls back to the original search path. So this means within this block, it will focus just within that schema so I can load in all of the other tables by just loading in that schema.rb file like I did in the console. And then I can drop the table of the tenants table. Now there might be other tables that you want to drop here if you want other models to be available within all tenants, such as maybe the users table. But uh, that depends on the application. Here I'm just dropping the tenants. Now let's try this out in the console. I'll create a new tenant, give it a subdomain of chunky bacon, and when I do so, it's going to not only create the tenant record, but also set up the schema and load in all the tables and then delete that uh, tenants table. Now the performance seems to be really good on this, but you might want to move this off into a background process, especially if you have a large schema you're loading in. All right, now that we've got our database set up, we can hook it into our controller layer. We want it so that if you specify a subdomain in the URL, that will use that schema to restrict to just that data. I'm going to do this inside of the application controller so it happens globally. I'll make an around filter, and let's call it scope current tenant, and then I'll define a method down here with that same name. So in here I need to fetch the current tenant, and I'm going to move that into a method called current tenant, and I would need to call a scope schema on this, which is the method that I set up on the tenant model earlier, which will change the schema search path for that tenant. And I can pass in additional search paths into this, such as the public, because I want to include that in this scope as well. And since an around filter takes a block, I'll pass the block into here, so that way it'll just scope the schema around our request. Now all that's left is to define this current tenant method, which I'm just going to paste in because it's the same that I did last week's episode, where I just call a find by subdomain on the tenant and based on the request subdomain. I'm also making this a helper method so we can access it in the view. By the way, to learn more about subdomains, watch episode 123. So with that change, I can try reloading this page, and yay, that worked! I'm working with a completely new set of data in a new schema, so that's why all the topics disappeared. Now if I try creating a new topic, then it should create it just within that schema's topics table. So going back here, it's within this tenant, but if I go to the cheese tenant, then I don't see that topic. So with very little code, we've successfully scoped all the data separately for each tenant. However, there is a gotcha when dealing with migrations. Let's try generating a new migration for adding a sticky column to the topics table. And that'll just be a Boolean attribute. Now when I run rakedb migrate, this will add that column to the topics table, but only for the public schema. All the other tenant schemas are unaffected. So what we need to do is loop through each of the tenants and migrate the database for those as well. I'm going to do this in a custom rank task in our application. Under the lib tasks directory, I'll make a new file. Let's call it a multi-tenant.rake. Now to save us some time, I'll just paste in this code. Uh, so here's what it does. Uh, first, I make an array of the various rake tasks that I want to add a multi-tenancy to. And then I make a multi-tenant namespace and loop through each of these tasks so that I can make a new task for each one of those in this namespace. So this will loop through each of the tenants and then scope it to that tenant schema and then execute the original rake task. Now optionally, you might want to enhance the original task as well. So here for each of those rake tasks, I'm enhancing them, which basically means I will add that multi-tenant task to the original task. So when I run rake db migrate, it will automatically run the multi-tenant db migrate task. So with that change, now when I run rake db migrate, it's going to run the migrations for each of the tenants. 
And there we go. For each one, you can see it added that sticky column. Now the question is, what if we have a migration that we only want to affect the public schema? For example, what if we want to add a name column to the uh, tenants table? And that'll just be a string type. What we can do is modify this migration to, to make sure that we have a table that exists called tenants. So that way it won't actually run this migration on the other schemas because that table doesn't exist. Let's try this by running right db migrate and it should only add that column to that one table. You can see here the other tenant schemas do a table exist check, but only the public one adds the column. Now that we have a name attribute on our tenant model, we can use that elsewhere in our application. For example, right here where I'm displaying cheese forum, I'm going to use the current tenant's name and I'll update the records in the database off camera. Now our application says chunky bacon forum and has its own data completely set apart for that tenant. If I change tenants, it changes the name and the data is separate as well. Now for more information on using Postgres schemas for multi-tenancy, check out this blog post by Jared Santo. It was a big help in putting together this episode. Also, if you'd rather not implement this from scratch, check out the Apartment Gem by Brad Robertson. It gives you the tools to do most of what I showed you how to do here. Well, now we know two different ways to implement multi-tenancy. So how do we choose between scopes or schemas? A good question to ask yourself is, are you going to have fewer large tenants or a lot of tiny tenants? Because if there are a lot of tenants, then it's probably a good idea to go with scopes just so you don't have to manage a whole lot of different schemas and run migrations on each one separately. But if there are uh, fewer large tenants, then I think Postgres schemas are a great way. And that's all I have for this episode. Thanks for watching.